Thank you. All right, so I am Kevin Miller. I am the Vice President of Creative and Medical Sciences at InVivo Communications here in Toronto. We are a specialized digital agency that focuses exclusively on the medical and health sciences space. Oh, is it loud enough? Okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry, shoulder talk. Okay. Um, our agency has clients that include medical device, pharmaceutical, biotechnology, and scientifically oriented institutions and organizations. So to start today, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on Avivo Communications, talk about our team, a little bit about our makeup and the kind of work we do. We'll go through some recent examples of virtual reality and augmented reality projects that we've worked on. And then I'm going to talk about some of the challenges that we have because it is a bit unique working in this space. In Vivo was established in 1998, and although we are based in Toronto, 90% of the work we do is actually outside of Canada, primarily in the US, but also in Europe. We have a team of 70 people plus and growing. And I think what really makes InVivo unique is that we have approximately 80% of the employees with a background in the sciences. And when you marry that up with the creativity that typical agencies have, you can produce some really great work that, work that fits within this field. So what does our team look like? Well, it's a multidisciplinary team, all under one roof. We have everything from medical animators, developers, quality assurance, medical writing, uh, user experience, strategic innovation, and instructional designers all together. And in Vivo, we say that science is at the root of everything. And we, we marry technology and visualization as a way of being able to accelerate learning and improve overall health. That's our mission. So what does that mean? Well, we have four major buckets of areas where we actually produce visualization and produce work. First one is medical content and writing. We do medical animations and videos. We do software applications, so anything from patient insight applications or tracking apps to calculators for physicians or e-learning modules. But it's the last, calculate, the last category here that I'm going to speak more about, which is games and simulations. It's an area we've been in for approximately 10 years, and in the last few years, we've really uh, gravitated towards augmented and virtual reality to have a leadership position in this field. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to walk you through some case studies, specifically at the beginning with virtual reality and then some augmented reality ones. So we had a client, Medtronic, who approached us because they had a challenge. They wanted to be able to educate physicians on the use of drug-coated balloons, DCBs, as a primary therapy for peripheral artery disease. And they wanted to be able to take the great data they had regarding their own product and position it, the Medtronic, the Imp Impact Admiral DCB, as the product of choice for any time this surgery is being performed. So how do we approach that? Well, we created an immersive 3D VR experience that could bring to life the key differentiating factors associated with this product, the Impact Admiral DCB. It was seven chapters, and it covered everything from background information on the disease to properties of the device, the balloon, the drug, the stent, the excipient, all those characteristics. The platform for this was actually the Oculus SDK. This project was done in 2015, and at that time, that was the platform that was available to us. Upon completing the, the product, we actually created a little video uh, that demonstrates a small snippet of what that program looked like, just so you guys can get a chance to see that. There's no audio. No, there, there is, should be audio. Nope, there's still no audio. Do you get it plugged into the right spot? Let's reload that slide. Let's see again. No? Can I give you get a second up here for you to it should be playing from my laptop, yeah. Let's we'll see. Yeah, it's quieted on my speakers, though. Let me. OK, hold on. Oops. 
slide show. Yes. Okay. Oops, let's go back. Sorry. I apologize. I will have to proceed without audio, unfortunately. Okay. So just know it's no problem. So this was a this was the seven chapter animation that we built in virtual reality. Um, Essentially, it takes the viewer on a journey uh, as the device is being deployed. It includes everything from background information on it as well. Um, the system consists of a number of different parts, and we wanted to make sure we focused on each one of those. And this uh, little clip is just to give you an idea of what that looks like. All right. Okay, so this program was first launched in 2015, as I mentioned, uh, in the spring of 2015 at a conference in London, England called Charing Cross. Uh, we had two Oculus workstations that were set up there, and uh, it was the first time that Medtronic had actually engaged a client to come and develop something on this platform. So it was very new for them. And the response that we got from that conference was fantastic. As a result, post-conference, a lot of the representatives that work for Medtronic had the opportunity to sign out one of these workstations and then travel to regional events where they could invite physicians to come and try it out. Since Medtronic hadn't done this kind of work before, they wanted to have a survey or some sort of uh, to gather information that would help them to better understand how it was being used, what type of response that they were getting, how physicians were enjoying it, or what type of uh, impact it would have on their business. So we created a survey. Um, that they could that helped uh, uh, go out to the field force, and out of all the uh, questions, uh, I've just included a sampling of one of them because I think this is one that's really important. Uh, it was how has the Medtronic VR experience effective, effectively helped you uh, to drive your business? And keep in mind, at the beginning of 2015, Oculus had just come out; it was very new, so it's no surprise that it's a cool thing to talk about. It was a shiny object at that point in time, so no surprise there. But what was really interesting was that. Uh, reps had been trying to engage in working with doctors for a long time, and 61%, even more than felt it was a shiny object, felt that it was an engaging experience. It offered them something that they hadn't been able to do with their physicians at that point in time. And they felt it was an effective way to explain a product. Only 5% of those people that actually used it thought that it didn't actually help drive business or help make, make a better understanding about what they were trying to, uh, trying to do. So based on the success of that, we took the project back internally and we re reworked it. So we made it work on a phone platform. We built it for uh, the Gear VR uh, system with a Samsung phone, created a user guide, uh, headphones, and a custom kit. And this way we were able to ship out numerous uh, kits out all over the world. So this is something that's currently being used right now with the Medtronic Field Force. And they're going to physicians and talking to them about this. The second case study was a client on the pharmaceutical sides, and it's uh, Novartis, they asked us to create an empathetic and educational patient journey that would support the release of new treatment-free remission data that had recently been published. So what does that look like? Well, we decided to create an immersive and empathetic experience for audiences to understand the journey of a patient who's undergoing CML. CML is a type of leukemia. From the point of diagnosis, all the way through their initial consultation with a physician, their first line treatment, potentially switching to a second line treatment, to the point where they may actually reach treatment free remission. We chose a low polygon look for this for two reasons. First of all, the platform was going to be used on Google uh, Cardboards. And so we wanted to make sure that from a playback standpoint, from a latency issue, that there would be no issues. And low polygon helped to solve that. It also was a consumer-friendly um, and visually appealing way of approaching that challenge. One of the other visual things that we took into account was this was an empathy piece. We were showing a person who had ultimately been diagnosed with something that's very serious as they make their way through these, um, these different touch points along their journey. And so the world starts out gray, uh, grayscale and black and white when they first get their diagnosis. And as they go through each of these different steps through the VR experience, color is gradually added until the end where the, the entire scene is full, full color. This is how that was displayed at a conference in Spain uh, earlier this year called uh, the European Hematology Association, EHA. The third case study we developed is something a little bit similar to what Walter showed you guys earlier. Uh, in fact, we actually had conversations with the folks at OsloVR about the work we're doing because it's very similar. 
we, uh, we wanted to create a realistic operating room in, in, in virtual reality that could demonstrate the power of VR to educate, to train, and to market, specifically for our medical device clients. So we chose the HTC Vive because we felt that as a platform, it was probably the most closely associated with what a surgeon would be expected to do in that environment. They would need to walk around a physical space. They would need their hands to be able to have the dexterity to pick up objects, to move things, to perform tasks. They might actually even need to play the role of multiple individuals in that space so they could navigate between those different players. The one thing you might note um, in looking at this, we kept our operating room for this demo fairly generic. It's not specific for cardiology or neurology or orthopedics. And the rationale for doing that was that when we went out to our clients, we wanted to make sure that there was a situation where they can envision their products being a part of this. So I don't think there'll be audio for this, but maybe I'll just put mine down here. Can you guys hear that a little bit better now? That cord's not working. So the great thing about this was that for a lot of our clients, they'd now heard about uh, the, uh, the Oculus, but they weren't necessarily familiar with um, they weren't necessarily familiar with HTC Vive, and we wanted to be able to demo that to them. So by sending out these videos and letting them know that we were working this space, it gave us an opportunity to take that platform, which we made portable. Which obviously, with HTC Vive, it's not exactly the easiest, but we did do that, and we traveled out to our clients to show them the kind of work we were doing. And the great thing about it is that when they had a chance to try it firsthand, it really resonated with them. And so right now we have two projects with, uh, with medical device companies to build out virtual simulated uh, operating rooms because of that. Okay, so moving on to augmented reality. This is for another medical device client that we have. It's, uh, and they wanted to mitigate concerns regarding space requirements for large surgical equipment. They wanted to reduce the need for actual equipment to have to be shipped out to a physical location in order to help show how that device worked. This product is for Alcon, who um, may, people may know as an uh, ophthalmology company. They do everything from contact lenses and solutions to pharmaceutical products for the eye to uh, the equipment that you use for eye surgeries. And the way we did this is that we used a piece of a, a, an asset that they already had in their repertoire. That, that little square on the floor, that's actually their printed brochure that talks everything about the, uh, the LensX machine. And by using that and knowing what the size of that was, we could place that on the floor and through an iPad application, we could project back up onto the iPad the actual size of the device with textures and it could be fully uh, in 3D so they could walk around it. And that would help to reduce the need and the time required to have a physical model shipped out. It meant that they could see if it fits within the space within their hospital that they thought that they'd need allocated for it. The other thing that we included as part of that on the application was the ability to turn on labels or look at the features or the technical specifications associated with it so that they could get a really good understanding of what this device would actually be like. This is a view of what it would look like if you were using the, the actual application. What's a really neat little aside on this is that we had the opportunity to take our application and bring it to a location where there was a LensX machine and put it on the floor and show it on screen next to a real one. And with the scale and the colors and everything matching up, we did a screen capture, and we asked individuals to tell us afterwards if they could figure out which one was the real one. And other than some small issues regarding uh, where the shadows were being cast, most people couldn't tell the difference. So, you know, testament to the work that the animation team did. And obviously, the success of something like this, where you can, in fact, truly rep replicate what that would look like in that environment. The second augmented reality case study we're going to talk about is from a cosmetic surgeon named Dr. Frank Rosengaus, who has a company called Ultimate Medica. And his challenge was that he wanted to educate dermatologists and surgeons on facial landmarking used in elective or cosmetic facial surgery procedures. 
And he gets asked to do a lot of presentations. He's, he's world-renowned, and he gets, he's asked to come in front of our audiences and showcase his technique as to how to do landmarking. And historically, the way he's been doing that is he'll hire a model when he gets into the city, have them come up on stage, pull out a Sharpie pen, and draw all over their face. He'll do landmarking where he'll put injectables, where he would do incisions, where the fillers would go if it was for reconstructive, where he'd do all the landmarking, and showing you where that underlying anatomy is. Now, despite the fact that that's also a very low-tech solution, it's probably not very appealing for the model who's hired to do that. So what did we do? <clears throat> well, we took three pieces of technology and combined them together. The first thing we did is we took the structure I.O. as a capture camera, where we could capture an entire person's head front to back. Once that 3D model of that person was captured, we could bring it into a proprietary iPad application that we developed that pairs it with your underlying anatomy. So now, not only is it a skin layer, but below that you have bone, you have muscle, you have nerves, vasculature, fat. All those things are under there and they match to the skin. As you can see along the side there too, we have a whole bunch of different layers. So you can turn off and toggle any of those. You can rotate that model around. And it comes with the ability to do markups. So you can see that on that iPad application, he's, we're doing lines, we're adding markups on it. Now imagine, he also owns a clinic. So imagine having a patient that's in the clinic and he's talking about what he's gonna do. Historically, what he's doing is he's have, he has that patient sitting there with a mirror in front of them and he's talking to them while they're looking in the mirror. Well, now they're able to look at the iPad together and he can explain in a way that's much more meaningful how he's gonna be performing something, what, how he's gonna do. He's doing pre-surgical planning, but he's also looking at that individual face-to-face -face and having a conversation about where things are gonna go. So the last element to this is we took that, and the reason why there's a hologram on the table is that we paired it up with a HoloLens. Because he gives all these different uh, talks at conferences, he wanted the ability to still have that tangible aspect of being able to walk around an object to be able to interact with it. So when he goes up on stage, he takes his iPad application, he marks it up, and he's wearing his HoloLens and it's paired to a, a large screen display so the audience can see what he sees. And he's able to interact with it and switch between different layers and go down to that muscular layer, show the muscles that are involved or the nerves that are around that area, do his landmarking, and he's really able to sort of complete that story. That was used this year for the first time earlier in uh, February in Cancun, Mexico for one of his talks. You can see that's, uh, that's how he was using it up on stage, wearing the HoloLens. The last case study that we did was we developed an internal project. So last year we got our HoloLens around this time. And we were really excited because it was a technology that we hadn't had a lot of opportunity to play with before. Uh, we'd done AR, but it had been mostly through screens. This was actually projected back, obviously, through the HoloLens. Uh, and we wanted to show our clients and show everyone that we were leaders in this space. So our goal was to create a, an AR technology piece that used HoloLens to educate and engage the scientific community. And we chose the story of using CRISPR gene therapy as a potential way of treating cystic fibrosis. So this is a scene from that, and essentially uh, this indicates all the areas that might be affected by a child who has cystic fibrosis. Well, our clients didn't know what HoloLens was, so we had to create a demo video to, get, to gain excitement regarding that.
So for our clients who had never heard of HoloLens before, this was a way for us to be able to introduce that technology to them. And knowing that the HoloLens is very portable, we get, it got us an opportunity to go out and show them that technology and experience it firsthand. So now that we've shared some of those case studies, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about some of the challenges because this looks like a lot of fun, but there's actually a lot of work that goes into being able to get our projects to the point where they're at. One of the first things you need to know about working in the, with, medic, with uh, mixed reality or augmented reality and virtual reality in healthcare is that there's a really large medical legal re uh, regulatory environment that you have to navigate. Anything that's included in your applications or in your programs has to be scientifically validated we have to be able to have a journal reference or a citation to back up anything. And that's not just what the words are being, that are being said, it's actually visualization as well. And we have to go in there in some cases and even defend that work in front of the regulatory body to talk about why we've made those, that, those decisions and how we've shown a macrophage binding or eating something and make sure that it's accurate. You say, okay, well, we got through that part. Well, then there's another layer of that. In some instances, we have to put that same project through an additional uh, regulatory environment, and that's at the federal level. So in Canada, that's a group called PAB, or in the US, the FDA, and we have to do that again. So you say, okay, well, great, we got through that. Well, after that, we have to make sure that any information that's included into our programs is balanced. If we're talking about the benefits of using a product or a device, we also have to make sure that the physician who's going to potentially prescribe this or use this knows about the risks associated with it. So we have to include everything from prescribing information, important safety information, brief statements, or disclaimers that might be associated with that project. So what does that look like? Well, this is a highlights of the prescribing information. That's the first page out of 26. And you'd ask yourself, well, how can you include something like that into mixed reality? Well, I'll give you a really quick example of how we've been able to do that. We just did a project earlier this year for a client that makes a drug called Lemtrada. And as you can see on the right-hand side, it says, stair here to begin. That bus button was disabled for the first minute of play. What you had to do is you had to look at the left-hand side and it would scroll for a minute before that button would be activated. And if a, phys if a physician was interested, they could actually stay and watch the whole thing. And then they could begin their experience whenever they wanted after that minute was expired and, and the button enab enabled. At any point during the actual experience that they were, that they were going through, there was, a, there was an option for them to be able to use a dock just out of their field of view that would allow them to bring that material back up so that they could look at it again. So throughout the experience, this had to be available. The second thing that we experience is the fact that these reviewers that look at all of our content are historically not very well versed or haven't had a lot of experience in AR or VR they're individuals that, for the most part, are used to seeing printed materials or PDFs. And if it doesn't fit in a box like this and can be printed out in front of you, they're really not sure how to look at it. And as we know, with augmented and virtual reality, for the most part, material doesn't always exist directly in front of a viewer. It can be to the left, above, or behind. So how do you present this kind of in material to a reviewer or to a team that doesn't necessarily know what they're expecting? Well, we developed at Invivo a custom mixed reality storyboard, and it includes a lot of additional information. It includes what the viewer might see off to different sides. It includes extra labels. It helps to provide them with a bit more of an overview of what this kind of experience is and provide them with guidance. It's an entirely different template than what we would normally use, but it's been really helpful in helping to make sure that those people that are looking at it have a better idea of what's coming. The second piece of that is we do an onboarding with both the clients and the reviewers at the beginning of this pro our projects. We show them what they're gonna be getting in advance and what that would look like at the end so that they can pair those two things up together. Because ultimately at the end of the day, if, they're not, if you're not able to get these things approved, the project doesn't get finished. The last thing we have as a challenge is the fact that really for this, for at this point in time, a lack of really strong return on investment is not necessarily available in uh, medical, in the mixed reality for the healthcare. And understanding about potential return on investment is really important before starting a project. Our clients often come to us and say at the beginning, well, how do we know that this was successful? How can you prove to me that there was improved learning or engagement or we had better retention or in fact there was an increase in sales? Well, as a result, we've had our medical writing team go out and create a white paper. And essentially that is a collection of all the research that they've been able to accumulate based on different journals or case studies that have been published to this date. 
And we use that information as something that we include with proposals. But as we know, this is a new area. So a strong OR is something that's being established right now. And its use is only going to increase, especially, uh, obviously, listening to Walter's talk pre preceding this. There's a lot of work going on in academia right now, and there is new publications coming out. So we know that that argument is going to be better as we move forward. So if any of you actually are working in this area and evaluating outcomes, I would definitely encourage you to publish this data, because it will help to strengthen and support the kinds of VR and AR projects that are being used. And it will continue to allow us to have the opportunity to work in this really exciting new field for healthcare. Thank you.